ahead and rejoice and be glad in him. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. You are worthy of our praise. In your holy name we pray. Amen. All right, come on. Put your hands together.
rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. resurrecting life, your resurrecting power, oh God. We give you glory. We thank you, Lord, because we will see victory in every situation that comes towards us, Lord God, for you are victorious, oh God. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Morning. 
you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good you take you take what the enemy and you turn it for good You turn it for good I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs today father you are a miracle working God and you are moving right now even in our midst Lord God where we are you are meeting us we thank you Jesus for touching our hearts Lord God for touching our lives we declare healing right now whatever devices we're watching through right now or listening to, we ask that your healing power would work through the sound waves right now in the mighty name of Jesus. You are holy and worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Worship you. You are here. 
you are here. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, bending every heart. I worship you. I worship you.
Oh, praise the Lord. God is very good to us, is he not? Well, Pastor Ted coming to you one more time online because it would seem that old man winter is rising up and blowing that white stuff at us. Now, listen, I am from California, so I didn't grow up with a lot of snow. You had to go up to the mountains to experience it. So when I moved out east, I just fell in love with snow. But man, you know, I'm also a pastor and I, I love seeing you all. And it just, uh, it, it bums me out a bit not to be able to gather together. We were supposed to gather together and start our Wednesday um, ministries back. But we'll wait till next week and, and hopefully and prayerfully we'll get to have our service. We're still planning on this coming Sunday having service if everything stays clear and this coming Sunday is um, we'll have something a little special for you it's Valentine's Sunday and so we're going to be sharing you know on love and marriage and things like that but I want to begin a series today called the adventure the adventure you see I believe that God has designed our life to be an adventure story okay an adventure story, not some sort of a depressing, boring kind of just survive kind of life. But he wants us to experience fully things that we couldn't even imagine. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what he has prepared for them that love him. So he has prepared things for us up ahead. And they tend to be adventures while we're on our way there. And uh, the dictionary describes an adventure in this way as an unusual, exciting, and potentially risky or hazardous experience. It means to explore unknown territory. It means to risk a potentially perilous undertaking in order to experience a wonderful and even miraculous occurrence. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to use this wonderful guy named Abraham, the father of faith, and look at his story and see how that his life became a grand adventure and how God is calling us to do the same. Abraham's life was an adventure, and God means our life to be an adventure too. Unfortunately, as we get older in the faith, we get more conservative when it comes to taking risk, and we tend to lose our sense of adventure. Okay, Mark Batterson, uh, author and pastor in, in our D.C. area, says we must quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. And many times that's the way. As we get older, we become, we take less risk, therefore we experience less adventure. But in our story, our guy Abraham Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8 says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, notice this, even though he didn't know where he was going. So God called him out and didn't tell him where he was going. He just said, follow me. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. So I'm going to call you out, saint. Come on, I'm going to call you out to regain your sense of adventure. 2020 just closed everybody in it. It uh, quarantined everybody. But I think what happened was not only did it quarantine us in our, our physical mobility, but it quarantined us in our spirit. And I want to challenge you to break out of that spirit and to allow God to embed in your spirit a sense of adventure. You see, to follow Christ by faith, we must regularly push ourselves outside of our natural 
comfort zones to follow him into the adventure zone. So Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 says, let us move beyond just the elementary teachings of Christ and move forward into maturity. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 18 says, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter till the full light of day. You know, back in the the um, times before there had been a circumnavigation of the globe, old maps had a place on the map that was called terra incognita. And that literally meant uncharted territory. And on the maps, it would have pictures of, of uh, sea monsters and, and, and other kinds of monsters, basically to say, this is uncharted territory. It's not a place that you need to be going, but I'm going to challenge you. There are places that you and I have never been before in the Lord, and it's time for us to spiritually go to terra incognita. All the way back in, in the early 1800s, the United States of America uh, doubled in size by something called the Louisiana Purchase. The only problem was we did not know what we actually had been granted or we had purchased. And so there was a group of individuals that were assembled called the Corps of Discovery. And they were headed up by Lewis and Clark, and they went to go map out, and they went to go search out and explore what we had. Now the scripture says God has given to us very great and precious promises. They're, they're beyond what we could ever imagine. He says by these we become participators in his divine nature. Now, unfortunately, too many times, we don't, we don't go after those promises. We don't go into that lifestyle. We're kind of sit, soak, and sour, you know, in our faith, and we wonder where all the wonders gone, but nothing about following Christ is ordinary. And so, in your Bibles in Genesis chapter number 2, I want us to look for a few minutes at this guy named Abraham, and I want you to see three things that happened to him that brought him into his spiritual adventure. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1 says, The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your country. There comes a point in time where we've got to be willing to leave where we are. Leave your country, your people, and um, your father's household, and go to a land that I am going to show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. I, you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse them. And all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. And then it says, so Abraham left as the Lord had told him. Now, here's three things that I want us to see that move us into this adventurous life that God has for us from the life of Abraham. And the first thing I want you to see is that he received an adventurous call. You see, as believers, our lives are defined by the calling of God. Now, the word call or calling is the Greek word klesis, and it means an invitation. The Lord is always inviting us. Come on, come on, come on. Come over, see this, experience this. Go here, go there. It's an invitation that becomes a vocation. It is a moment that creates and calls for a lifelong journey. So God invites us in a moment, and he calls us to a lifetime of adventure. The favorite term for believers in the New Testament is the word saint. 
Did you know you're a saint? <laughs> okay, you are a saint. Um, is the, it's the, word, the Greek word kletos. And it means one called. One called out for holy purposes. So God is constantly calling us out for holy purposes. And he wants our life to be a life that is called, uh, that, that leads throughout our lifetime into spiritual adventure. Peter said this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belong to God who should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and called you into his marvelous light. People that are given to adventure always have a sense of calling about their life. God's call is the pull and the motivation that fuels this sense of adventure. We must have uh, this sense of adventure that we must have to fully ascertain and realize the promises that God has called us unto. I think about a wonderful guy that embodied this sense of, of faith adventure, and his name was Dr. David Livingston. Now, Dr. David Livingston was a Scottish uh, missionary who became an explorer of the continent of Africa. He discovered all different kinds of regions throughout um, Africa, and he was a great missionary to take the gospel there. And here's some things that he said. He said, I am prepared to go anywhere provided it's forward. Okay, I'm moving forward. Nothing's holding me back. He said this, if you have men who only want to come if there's a good road, I don't want them. I want those who will come if there is no road at all. He said this, there is only one safe and happy place, and that is in the will of of God and God's will took him to many places that appeared to be on the outward dangerous but as long as you're in the will of God it's the safest most fulfilling place you can ever be he said this without Christ not one step with Christ anywhere and that was the heart of this individual so when he died at the end of his life his body was brought to Westminster Abbey. He was, he was famous and he was a hero in the British Isles. And he is buried there. His body is, but his heart is not. You see, they took his heart out and they buried it in Africa because that's where his heart had taken him. That's where God's call had taken him. I want to ask you this. Where is your heart buried? Is your heart buried in comfort? Is your heart buried in your job? Is your heart buried in just getting through and surviving in life? Or is your heart buried in the adventurous call of God? Do you want to go wherever God leads you, no matter what the risk? Now think about this call. There are three things about this call I want you to see. First of all, it was Personal. You see, in the first three verses of Genesis chapter 12, God uses 17 personal pronouns. In other words, he's identifying that for Abraham, this is personal. God personally called Abraham, and I want you to know that God has a personal call for you and I, because if it's not personal... It will never be portable, and that means you won't take it with you. And we always need to be traveling on this journey of faith with this sense of call to holy adventure. But it also came, and it invaded 
his ordinary world. It did, wasn't something that happened that was, out, you know, happened in an extraordinary situation. No, it was God's extraordinary that came into Abraham's ordinary. We really don't know what was going on in Abraham's life. He was just living his life when God called for him to go into spiritual adventure. All throughout the Bible, it was that way. Moses, David, and Amos were called when they were tending sheep. Peter and Andrew were called when they were casting nets. James and John were called when they were mending nets. The Samaritan woman was called when she was drawing water. You see, it doesn't matter how ordinary your world, if you have a heart that is open to God, he will call you out of your ordinary place into his extraordinary adventure. But another thing about this call is this. It required him to leave one place in order to go to the place that God had for him. He would never experience what God had till he walked away from what he had. Now for us to experience and to go where God has for us and fully apprehend what he has for us, we must be willing to leave where we currently are our comfort zones. And so the first thing we need to see about Abraham that is good for us today too is he received an adventurous call. And our life is defined by the calling of God. The second thing I want you to see about him was he got some amazing promises. So in verses 2 and 3, God begins to speak to him, promises into his life. And it became known as the Abrahamic covenant. Because did you know that God is a God of covenants? Okay? All throughout scripture we see that. In the garden there's the Edenic covenant. The, that he made with man in the garden of Eden. Then there's the Noahic covenant that happened after Noah came out of the ark. Then there's the Abrahamic covenant. Then there was the Mosaic covenant that he made with Moses. Then there was the priestly covenant. Then there was the Davidic covenant that he made with David. And now we operate in the new covenant covenant. You see, God is a God of covenants. God is a God of promises. The word covenant is the word bereth, and it means a promise and agreement from God to an individual or people, a guarantee to act in a particular way. And so not only was Abraham defined by the call, but his call was fueled by promises. Through Abraham, the Jews would become a covenant people. And for us, through Christ, we would be brought in, as Galatians 3.14 says, into the covenant of Abraham as well. And so, as we look at this, we see that, that God makes five promises to Abraham. If he's willing to leave where he is, God says, this is what I will do for you. And the first thing he says is, I will make you a great nation. Now remember, when God is talking to Abraham, he doesn't even have a kid yet. He's old. His wife is barren. And yet the scripture says in Romans 4, 17, that God calls those things that are not as though they were. So God prophetically spoke covenant blessing over Abraham and said, you don't even have a child now, but you're going to be a father of nations. 
Then he says, I will bless you. The word bless, Barak, in the Hebrew means to to bestow divine favor. To open one's hand a blessing, provision, and protection toward. And so he says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bestow my favor on you. I'm going to open my hand a blessing, my hand of provision, my hand of protection upon you. Then he says, I'm going to make your name great. The word great Gadal in the Hebrew means bigger and more far-reaching than any other to turn up the, va- the volume. And so he says, you're just this guy in this particular region, but I'm going to make your name so far greater and far-reaching with more volume than anything you could ever imagine. He says, and I'm going to make you a blessing. He says, through you all the people of earth will be blessed. You see, the measure of our blessing is not all we have to get, all we get to have, but all we have to give. And so he says, I'm going to bless you to the point to where it's going to overflow from your life to other people's lives. Then he says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And uh, and throughout scripture, he would warn people not to touch the apple of his eye, which was his covenant people. Okay, so as you see all these things, I want you to understand this is something that God prophetically spoke over Abraham that he was going to do. But because of Christ, Galatians 3.14 says that we have been we have been granted access to the blessings or the Abrahamic covenant. Isn't that great? That's amazing. These promises spoke to God's future plans for Abraham's life. They weren't just descriptive of where he was. They were prescriptive of where God wanted to take him. Likewise, God has given us over 7,000 promises in his word that tell us where he wants to take us, that prescribe for us a future that he has intended for us, but we get, we got to get that sense of call in order to experience it. Never forget that our future is as bright and as hope-filled as the promises of God. There are some of you right now, you are laboring under a problem. You're laboring with an issue. But I came to tell you that God's promise is greater than your your problem. And His covenant is greater than your troubles. And He wants to call you beyond your trouble and beyond your problems into his promise that he has for you. The promises of God set the border, the rights, and the resources of our life. They define what we can and we cannot ask for. And so if God has promised you something in his word, then you can, in prayer, ask him for that thing that he said would be yours. 2 Peter chapter 1 Verse 3 and 4 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who's called us by His own glory and goodness. He says, through these, He has given to us very great and precious promises so that we may participate in His divine nature. All of these things that pertain to life and godliness, God has told us about in His covenant and in His promises. Amen. Now the final thing I want you to see in Abraham's life, so he received a call to adventure. He received amazing promises that weren't descriptive, but prescriptive. They were prophetic that called him to a place.
that God had prepared for him, that promised that God would meet him there and would act on his behalf. But the third thing, and I want you to lean in and listen anyway, we're going to study about this through Abraham's life. He journeyed through a challenging process. Okay, so you see there's a call, there's a promise, and there's a process. Let me say it again. There's a call, there's a promise, and there's a process. It started with a call and a covenant promise. These established a platform on which he could advance forward. He would incrementally, from one stage to the next, possess what God had promised. And as he would realize one stage, then God would call him to the next one. You see, that was the process. It didn't happen, bang, all at once. It happened incrementally. It happened stage by stage. Isaiah would say that he would take us from line to line, precept to precept, here a little and there a little. This call and these promises called him to future realities that God had intended for him. And so think about it. He says, if you will leave where you are, you'll take a risk. I will, speaking about the future, if you'll move out, if you'll move forward, I will make you a great nation. You're not a nation now. You don't even have a kid, but I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. He said, I'll make your name great. He said, you will be a blessing. All of those spoke to a future that God intended for him, but he had to be willing to leave where he was and incrementally go on a process from one stage to the next. And so Hebrews 11, 8 says, So he obeyed and went, not even knowing where he was going. And Genesis chapter 12, verse 6 says, Abraham traveled throughout the land. You see, that land of promise that God would give to him is really a metaphor for the Christian life. It is a picture of what God wants to do. He wants our life to be that which goes through things. Okay, not just stops and stop and stay but to move through from one stage to the next. God calls us to an amazing and promise-filled life. But to get there, we must be willing to go through a challenging process like Abraham in order to see the promises come to pass in our life. So Proverbs 4.18 says, the path of the righteous. Who's that? Those getting it right. Those going in the right direction. The right path, he said, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn. It shines brighter and brighter till the full light of day. You see, you're going up. That's a process that is taking you up. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 18 says, that with unveiled faces we behold his glory. And we are being transformed in our life. It's not a one-time thing, but we're being transformed. I say, I have been saved, I am saved, and I'm being saved. I'm learning how to live in the reality of my salvation. We are being transformed into His likeness from one degree of glory to the next. So just like Abraham was called away from where he was, he was fueled by the promises that God spoke to him, the covenant, this Abrahamic covenant that God had said would be his reality, then he had to walk through this land with God accomplishing certain things in his life along the way. And God wants that for you and I too. God wants to accomplish some things, some amazing things, some things we haven't heard about, we haven't seen, we haven't imagined in our life. 
that he has prepared for us, but we've got to be willing to go to that place. And you see in Abraham's life the different challenges in the process that he went through. One time, God would have given him, he would have already given him this promised son named Isaac. And so he gets up in the morning and God says, I want you to offer him to me. I want you to take him up to this Mount Moriah and I want you to give him as a sacrifice to me. I don't know about you, but that's a challenge, man. That's a challenge. You know what it says in that story? And we'll talk about it. Abraham rose early, grabbed his son, and went toward where God had called him to. His son saying, hey, Dad, what's up? What's going on? He's like, we're going to give a sacrifice to the Lord. And then pretty soon his, his son says, hey, Dad, where's the sacrifice? You know? And you know what Abraham said? He, he reached another stage in his faith. God will provide for himself a lamb. He went up there. He laid his son down at the altar. Sometimes we got to lay stuff on the altar. Come on, man. We got to lay our kids on the altar. We got to lay our marriage on the altar. We got to lay our aspirations and our dreams and our jobs and our finances and our dream houses on the altar. And he was willing to do what God had called him to. But it was just, it was a test. It was a test of his faith. Because strong faith is tested faith. And so the Lord stopped him from offering his son. Because God saw his heart. And already at that place, at that stage, at that point, God had a ram caught in the thicket. You see, if you're willing to go on that test and through that challenging process, you will find at the top of the hill of sacrifice, God has already provided a way for you. You've got to walk to it, though. You've got to walk to it. Man, I'm talking to somebody who's like, I'm not, I don't want to go. It might cost me. I don't want to go. It could be painful. I don't want to go. Oh man, if you will go, you will realize another provision of God that he has for you. And of course, it was that same hill region where the ultimate lamb would be offered, and that would be Jesus. Amen. So, as Abraham, we are called to live a life of adventure. It starts with an adventurous call. And listen, God will never call you someplace that he won't go with you. He said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. He said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. He is an ever-present help, even in time of trouble. So it starts with a call. Do you have a call? Do you have this thing in you, this burning desire to move into what God has? It is fueled by the amazing promises of God, over 7,000 promises in God's word that cover every eventuality, every situation, every dream, anything you could imagine. God has a promise for you. And it will require us to journey through a challenging process. That will be worth it when we arrive there. Think about the old song I grew up with. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. It will. Folks, it'll be worth it all. Everything will make sense then. He will wipe away every tear from our eye. You know, there are some things that God has put in your heart, just like Abraham, God put in his heart this thing. It's time to journey, and I, I want to challenge you. I want to journey with you. I want to challenge you to, to, to get on your, your hiking boots. Put your sandals, your walking sandals on. Come on, man. You know? And begin to walk in the direction of God's promises, because your future is always as bright as His promises. And you have a future, a future destiny that is greater than your current reality. If you are willing to obey 
and go through this process, when you get there, it will be worth it. I think about the moms that go through labor and you ladies that have been through it. You know, I, I'm only telling you, uh, using it as an illustration. I was there with my wife. There's quite a bit of labor. But even Isaiah says that that the labor is forgotten for the joy of the birth. Some of you are in a time of labor. You're struggling. But if you will continue to hold on to the hand of Jesus and reach out for the hem of his garment, then some things are going to be birthed in your life that's going to be worth the labor. Amen. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Ted, I really am going through a time of labor in my life. I am struggling deeply. You know, I, I need to get back that sense of calling. I'm kind of this whole 2020 just kind of messed with me and I'm not really sure where my life is headed. I need a new sense of call. Or maybe you'd say, Pastor Ted, I, I kind of have, have let go of the promises, you know, and I need a word. I need a promise from God. I need a covenant from God. And maybe you're here and you'd say, Pastor Ted, yeah, I've really been in that process. I just need some joy for the journey. I need some strength, you know, to continue to go to the next place that God has for me. I, wanna, I want you to stretch out your hand right now. I want to pray for you. Lord, you know where your kids are and you know how you put this thing in my heart, Lord, to challenge people, not to settle for where they are, but to move on to where you have called them to go, which is above and beyond what we could ever imagine in our own mind or in our own hearing, Lord. God, I pray that you will restore to us a sense of holy adventure, that you will restore to us our spiritual GPS, that you will call us heavenward, that you will put a high calling of God in our lives, Lord, and we will set out, Lord, called to something new. I pray that you'll remind us of your very great and precious promises that fuel and are the foundation for our forward movement. And God, as we journey through the hard process, the challenging process, may we keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. May we never lose sight of you, Lord, who began a good work in us, who will bring to completion that work in the day of Christ Jesus. You are at work in us. You are willing and you are doing your good purpose in our life, dear God. And Lord, I pray that you will encourage people and you will strengthen them and you will give them new vision, dear God, new, fresh vision for their life, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor Ted, I don't know Jesus. You know, I want to, I feel something, I, I need something in my life. There's a hole. I want you to, if you want to accept Christ... I want you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I come to you now. I have an empty hole in my life. I've been a sinner and I've sinned against you. But I know you are a Savior. You are my Savior. And I ask you to save me from my sins. To forgive me of all my sins. And to come and live inside my life. I accept you now. Take me on a great adventure in you. I receive you now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you made that response, I want to encourage you to make that notation in, in one of our bars there across your screen. Or maybe you don't have a home church and you live in the area. I want to encourage you to plug in. We're here every Sunday morning at 8.30 and, and at 10.30. And uh, we have Wednesday evening service that we'll be starting back. And uh, or if, if you have a home church, get plugged into your home church. Come on, man. Maybe you're too far. Find a spirit-filled Bible-believing church. An Assembly of God church, I recommend. You know, and get plugged in. And don't just sit and soak and sour, but sit and then stand up and serve. 
I want to give a good report. We had talked to you about our about giving toward a special project, and we asked you to continue to do that. It looked like our main water system was going to cost us about ten thousand dollars to replace. Well. On Monday, the plumber came out with all of the estimates, and it turns out it's going to be more like uh, close to 3000 And so that's much better, but we still need, if you would, give an offering. That would be a real blessing to us. Thank you so much for your giving. You can give online. You can send it into the church. Or you can, at the service time, we have a box that you can put it into. You know what? You can't outgive God. Kim and I were talking about it this week. You know, we haven't always been financially smart, but one thing we've always done is tithe. We've always believed in tithing, and God has always blessed us beyond what we can imagine. I love you so much. It continues to be my privilege to pastor here at Hope for the past 17 years, and as long as the Lord will let me. Listen, have a beautiful Weekend in the Lord. Stay safe out there in the snow. Love you, my friend.